The stock market is a battleground, and in this battle, it's us, the retail traders versus them, the institutional traders. And the divide is more apparent than ever before, with record profits being seen by these big institutional trading firms that deploy high frequency trading algorithms. So do the little guys like us even stand a chance anymore? As a reminder, I am in the middle of a small account challenge. I funded an account with a thousand bucks with the goal of seeing how quickly I could grow it. So we're gonna jump in here on day 13 and look at my first trade. AGFY is up 100% right now. It just had news that came out at 7.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And as soon as that news came out, the stock started moving. Now, one of the problems for me on this one was that it started moving so quickly, I jumped in almost impulsively as it was squeezing away because I didn't want to miss the move. We've been in a market where I've really struggled to get dialed in and where we've had stocks that have continued to move higher and higher and higher. It's felt like we've had these stocks that have popped up and then they just roll over. So if I'm not getting in quickly, I'm missing the move. So on this one, I jumped in as it was breaking over $2.30, $2.35. It goes up to $2.40. It goes up to just under $2.50. And I ended up selling it at $2.41 with a thousand shares. I locked up $55.84 of profit. Not a big win, but it's green nonetheless. Now, I would say this type of stock exemplifies where we as retail traders have an edge. And maybe to better understand where we have an edge, we have to think more clearly about where the institutional traders have an edge. Because where they have an edge, we clearly do not have an edge. Okay, so as the institutional high-frequency trading algorithms, these big market makers, the ones that are processing all of the orders that are coming through the market, they are making money by actively buying and selling shares every single day. What is incredible about these market makers is that they subscribe to a level of market data that you and I will never see. So they actually see the orders coming in before they get executed at the exchange. And this allows them to do something pretty incredible. Because they see the order coming in, they can adjust their orders accordingly. So for instance, if you've been actively trading, have you ever pressed the sell button for a big order and watched as the order filled at the bottom of a candle wick and then the stock comes right back up as soon as your order is out? That's because the market makers saw your order coming in, they pulled their own orders and you got filled at a worse price. And then once your order's gone, the price comes back up. The same thing happens if you buy a big chunk of shares. Brrr, all of a sudden, the stock will squeeze up, your order will get filled at the very top, and then it comes right back down. It feels unfair, but these market makers do not have a fiduciary obligation to do what's best for us. They're trying to make money. And you know what? We're trying to make money also. So in the market, it's kind of fair game although it's not really an even playing field because us retail traders would never have the resources to be able to have all of the tools and all of the data that give these big institutional trading firms their edge. All right, so their edge is going to come from stocks that are highly liquid, that there are millions and millions and millions of shares going through on, and stocks that are relatively compressed in their range because when they're buying and selling, buying and selling, they don't wanna be at risk of the stock suddenly dropping 50% or going up 50% because that's gonna create potentially really large losses. It's just not worth it. So what's very interesting is that these high frequency trading algorithms are touted as providing liquidity to the market. But in fact, they only provide liquidity when the market is in a very compressed range. Let me show you what that looks like. Let's jump onto the whiteboard. So what we know about these uh, high frequency trading algorithms is that when stocks are making big moves up or when they're making big moves back down, these firms move out of the way, which is why we see these crazy spikes up and these crazy drops back down. In fact, the flash crashes that we've seen in the market have been the result of these high frequency trading firms essentially pulling out of their orders entirely. And when they pull out of their orders entirely, there's no liquidity in the market. The areas where they are stacked on the bid and the offer are when stocks are in this narrow range. But as soon as a stock busts out of the range, 
up or to the downside, boom, all of a sudden those market makers thin out. So they actually have a system where once a stock exceeds a standard deviation, and I'm sure it's using AI and all this stuff, it's based on a certain period of time, they will actually pull their orders back entirely. Now, this was what led to several flash crashes, but in this market today, what we see, and I've seen this again and again and again, are these stocks become extremely thickly traded. You've probably heard me say that before. Why are these stocks becoming so thickly traded? What's happening is we've had the initial spike, a little pullback, and now those market makers are kind of digging in right here in this really compressed range. And there's a lot of trading, there's a lot of volume, there's a lot of liquidity, and this is where they make money. And as long as the stock is in this very narrow range of support and resistance, and sometimes it's a range of a dollar a share, but when it's in that range, that's where I find we do not have an edge. Now, this is certainly true on large cap stocks. It's certainly true on mid cap stocks, but more than ever, it's also true on small cap stocks once they are in consolidation. Okay. So if our edge, if their edge is when a stock is in consolidation, then inversely, our edge is going to be when a stock is breaking its deviation, standard deviation to the upside or the downside. So let's look back at this chart for a moment. So right in this moment here, AGFY has just squeezed up over 100%. This is an area where retail traders like you and I have a lot of opportunity. There's not big money here for these trading firms. These trading firms need to trade millions and millions of shares a day. This right now is only has 800,000 shares of total volume. While by the end of the day, the volume will be high, right now it's still pretty light. But you know what's gonna happen? is from this point forward, the stock is going to stay below 250 and it's gonna be in a very compressed range. One of the ways that I'm able to identify this is simply by looking at a chart and recognizing the high of the move and then the low. And if we're not continually making new highs, then I'm not interested. Another way that I can visualize this is by actually using the technical indicator called the MACD the moving average convergence divergence indicator. Because when a stock is squeezing up very quickly like this, for instance, what are those moving averages doing? They're moving apart, all right? So the MACD is gonna be very open as the stock is moving up, and then it's gonna cross right here as the stock starts coming back down. I have found that when the MACD crosses against the signal line right here, at this point, I am not interested in trading it. I do not want to trade once we've had this crossover. Again, if we look back on the chart right now, the MACD is open. It's currently open, but the price is below 250. So until the price can get back over 250, I'm not interested because we're range bound. We're underneath the highs. And the longer it stays below 250, the more those moving averages are going to converge. Now, if you notice on the one minute chart, there's right now a red candle, which is a false breakout candle. The stock started to pop up a little bit and then it flushes back down. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. This is now where it really becomes a battle. And I feel like retail traders don't have much of an edge trying to trade it in this range. So let's talk about the type of stocks that we're more likely to find an edge on. We'll jump over to the whiteboard. I have found consistently that the stocks that I make the most on have these five criteria. Number one, they're up at least 10% on the day and they're the leading gapper. Now, certainly there's no question AGFY was our leading gapper. The stock's up a hundred, well, right now it's up 74%. It's pulled back a little bit. It was up over hundred percent. So it was definitely our leading gapper. Number two, it should have news. Yes, AGFY has news that came out at 7.30 a.m. at the bottom of the hour, check. Number three, the relative volume should be at least five times. And in this case, it was. Number four, the price should be between $2 and $20. And it is. It's on the lower side of that range, being at $2 a share. It's, yes, it's a little on the cheaper side. And as you know, for my small account challenge right now, this is the type of stock that I just can't trade effectively. Unfortunately, I don't have leverage on any stock that's under $5 a share. One of the things that I'm finding to be a challenge uh, with this small account, and it is a small account challenge for a reason, is the limitations that are enforced by the broker. So for years and years trading with a large account, I really haven't faced any restrictions. Yes, I trade in a retirement account, which means I can't short stocks and I don't have leverage, 
But aside from that, I really don't have any restrictions. I can buy and sell pretty much whatever I want. But when you're trading in a really small account, now you've got to follow the rules of the broker. And this broker that I'm using, while they will give me six times leverage on a $1,000 deposit, which means I have up to $6,000 of buying power, I can only use that buying power on stocks over $5. And they take it a step further that there's a list of stocks above $5 that they've chosen to restrict leverage on because they're too concerned about the risk of volatility and potentially traders losing money on it and then owing that money back to the broker. So the result is I haven't been able to trade as much as I would like. Now, normally that doesn't really matter. I would take a couple of trades each week. I could make some progress, but it's been a problem here because I have a schedule and my schedule includes producing an episode of this challenge each week for you guys. So I'm trying to be really active, but what I'm finding is that I'm forcing trades on stocks that some of them are A quality. AGFY is a fine stock, but it's not a good stock for the small account because I can't buy enough shares. A $55 profit, well, after fees and commissions, let's see, you take away the fees and commissions on that $55 profit and boom, yeah, it's, is it green? Yeah, it's still a green day, but it's just not as much. And is it even worth it? So day 13, well, that was the only trade I got. And I could have just as easily not taken any trades at all. But let's jump back over to our whiteboard here. So the price being between two and 20, this is my typical range. But right now for this challenge, this is really the only range where I can do well. And that's because of the leverage and margin restrictions. Unfortunately, the market right now has been a little bit colder. Now, you know what? It's just the luck of the draw when you start trading that you'll either be in a hot market or a cold market. So there is some degree of trading that does come down to luck. Skill is far more important. You need skill. You need to master your emotions. But then there's also just the luck of the draw that the first day you start trading, you could have a day that the market's really, really hot, or you could have a day that the market's cold, and you could even start trading during a month where the market's cold. And that's what ended up happening for me at the beginning of this small account challenge. I started trading and it's been pretty cold. It's been a slow cycle. Now, that's not really a problem in most cases because, you know, it sort of always self-corrects over time, but it just means the beginning of the challenge, the progress is slower and it's even slower because of these additional restrictions. So I've certainly done well in my big account this month because stocks like AGFY, I can trade with 10,000 shares. That same trade is, that's a $55 winner in the small accounts, a $500 winner in the big account. And I actually pretty consistently saw that on the days where both accounts were green, my big account was up about 10 times the amount of the small account. So if the small account was up 100, the big account was up you know, well over a thousand, sometimes higher. If the small account was 300, the big account was 3000. And it just seemed to me that, yeah, that makes sense. And that's, that's because the relationship of share size, just the fact that with a small account, you can't buy as many shares. So if we get back onto the whiteboard here, uh, right now, the, these are my five criteria. So up 10% ideally has news, relative volume, five times higher price between two and 20, but really for the small account, it's gotta be between five and 10. And then the float, under 20 million shares available to trade is good. Under 10 is better. Under five, that's even better. The under 5 million share float, this also poses a risk to those institutional traders because when you have a stock that has a 5 million share float, these traders simply cannot buy the whole float, right? These institutional traders. So you end up having these stocks that make incredible moves and We've seen this again and again, where a $5 stock goes from five to 10 to 15 to 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, and they just go higher and higher. So these are the type of stocks that retail traders are gonna be jumping in and out of, in and out of, and where we can profit with small size. This is where we have an edge, but the big deep pocket institutional traders, the high frequency trading algorithms, not so much in this area. And this area for them poses a lot more risk and there's not as much profit opportunity as there would be on a stock that had extremely high volume and was trading in a compressed range where they can just recycle shares, just cycle them again and again and again and again. That's where they're just cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. It's the stocks that are outside the standard deviation going straight up or going straight down where those market makers basically pull out. Okay, so then our job as retail traders 
If we want to find success, we've got to be dialed in on a stronghold in the market in this battle where we still have an edge. And you know what? If we go a week or several weeks without seeing good opportunities, we got to lay in the tall grasses, patiently waiting. That's what we have to do. Because if we dip our toe out, we dip our hand out, boom, we're going to lose it. That's what happens. And I'm telling you, I've seen it happen again and again. And it was happening. It's been happening for a long time. But what this is the problem. Traders lose patience. And I'm no different. I lose my patience as well. And we break the ice, we start trading. And next thing you know, we're just getting in, we're getting out, we're getting in, we're getting out. And you know, the only person making money on that type of price action is the market maker. And it's not hard for us to accumulate big losses. Take a $300 loss there, a $300 loss there. And next thing you know, it starts to really add up. So something that I think that I underestimated a little bit in this challenge would be the difficulty that came with my need to trade pretty much every day to produce a weekly episode, but the fact that the market did not provide during this period a quality setups every single day. And so the result was I started trading lower quality setups. And well, what happens when you do that? Let's look at trade one from day 14. Okay, it's day 14. And I notice on my top gainer scanner, there's a stock that's begun moving up the scan quickly. It hasn't yet hit my high a day momentum scanner, but it is moving up. So the problem here is the reason the stock hasn't hit my high a day momentum scanner yet is because the quality isn't quite strong enough. It doesn't meet one of my criteria, but it is moving. So I type it in, I see it's up 47%. And right now we've got a 15 cent spread and I punch it with 500 shares at 399. Immediately I was looking for the breakthrough four and all of a sudden the bid drops to 358. We're at 370, we're at 380, 379. And I'm holding, I am like, what is happening? And now it's 328. Look at how fast that just dropped, 312. And in almost an instant, I'm down $400. That is a really big loss. Now, the setup on this was the half dollar, whole dollar breakout, which we talked about in episode four. So we know that stocks trade with a lot of respect to these psychological areas of support and resistance. So in this case, we're gonna draw out uh, $3, 350 and $4 here. So the stock comes up to this level, it taps it, and I got in right here at 399 for the breakthrough four, and initially we had a bid of about 385, which meant I was risking about 15 cents a share. Not bad, risking $75. And then all of a sudden the bid drops to about 350, 358. And in this moment, I'm thinking, well, as long as it holds 350, it's not ideal, but hopefully we'll get a bounce back up, but I gotta cut my loss if it breaks below 350. And then suddenly it drops right down to 328 and 312. And it does it so fast, there's almost no time to act. Now, some would say, Russ, if you had had a stop loss on this trade, it would have taken you out maybe even at 385. You just would have been out of the trade for a loss and, and that's done. You're right. But don't forget, this is a pre-market trade. This trade is happening at 826 in the morning, 825 in the morning. You cannot use stop orders pre-market. Even if you could use stop orders pre-market, there is no guarantee about how much slippage you may receive when that stop order executes. Because who executes the stop orders? The market makers receive that order and they're receiving that order as the stock is dropping, right? This is what I don't like about stop orders. Number one, Market makers can see the stop orders on the book. So they can actually see that your order is at 380 or 385. So there's a thing called stop hunting that we've heard about where market makers will flash the price down, all those stop orders execute, and then the price comes right back up. So in this case, even if I'd had a stop order, I still think I would have taken a significant loss, but probably not as big. So in this case, all of a sudden I'm in, and I'm down a lot. Now, if we analyze the trade and we look at the chart, you could see that I jumped in pretty quickly on the stock. It's a somewhat recent IPO. It's sold off, it's curling back up. And this is the type of stock that I've had huge wins on. So from the perspective of the type of stock, I was getting in very, er very early in the move on this micro pullback right under $4. It just happens that this one didn't go. And so what's the difference? Why is that? 
I would say this is because the market right now is colder. When you're in a colder market, and, and to help you kind of understand this again, rather than defining a cold market, let's start by defining a hot market. So what's happening in a hot market? In a hot market, we're seeing stocks back to back to back making huge moves, right? So when you start seeing a stock or several stocks making huge moves, how does that make you feel? Gives you a little bit of FOMO. And you're starting to think, where's the next one? And when you see the next one starting to pop up, what do you do? You jump in it sooner and with bigger size. You multiply that psychology times everyone participating in the market. And you know what happens? The market heats up. You start having stocks back to back to back, making 100, 200, 300% moves. And some of them are on really good volume with great liquidity where you can get in and out with 15, 25, 30,000 shares. You can be making 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 in a day. I know because I've done it. Of course, my results are not typical, but it is true that this can happen in these really hot markets. Okay, so that's a hot market. And then what ends up happening at the tail end of the hot market is you start seeing more violent rejections where these stocks will start to pop up and they get slammed back down. They start to pop up, they get slammed back down. And now people who are jumping in are starting to get burned and they're like, whoa, okay, this isn't so fun anymore. So they start sitting on the sidelines and you know who comes out? Some short sellers come out and they start shorting these more aggressively. Anything that pops up, they're shorting it. Anything that pops up, they're shorting it. And now the pendulum is sort of swinging back into the hands of the bears. All right. The hot market is over and we're in a cold market. And in a cold market, we see stocks in periods of con consolidation. We see the pops. They come right back down. We don't see big moves. And so when you're not seeing big moves, when a stock does pop up, people are hesitating. They're like, ooh, is this going to be the one? I'm not sure. And shorts are adding much faster and much more confidently. And the result is that things are slow. Something that I struggle with a little bit is that doing the same thing every single day means you're following the rules of your strategy. However, your strategy will perform better in certain markets than in others. And so on a day like today, I'm feeling kind of stupid because I'm like, gosh, darn it. I just jumped into this, you know, I, and now I'm taking a big loss and we're in a colder market. I should have known as much. I should have waited for it to start to really pick up. I should have waited for more volume to come in. But my fear was that by the time that volume comes in, it's going to be back into one of these compressed ranges and it's just going to be crowded, thickly traded, and the move is over. That we get this kind of one move and then that's just it because that's been more typical of the cold market. Okay, so things will start to shift back toward the hot side when you have stocks like this that pop up, shorts are confident, it comes back down, and then it goes higher. And now all of a sudden you've got buying because shorts are covering. And really it's the shorts covering that are sending it to the next level. And then the long bias traders are like, whoa, there's something going on over here. Should I get off the sidelines and participate? And now we jump in too, and you've got twice the buying volume because you've got short covering and buyers. And then you start to get the beginning of the next stocks popping up. So I would say in the last couple of weeks, because we've had only maybe two or three stocks that made pretty big moves, we're still pretty solidly in a cold cycle, but we're starting to see a couple little bubbles like things are maybe turning around, which would be great. Unfortunately, that's not going to save me today on day 14. ULY, I'm down $374 on it, and I end up cutting the loss just before it breaks below $3, and I lose over $400 on it, which is nearly a dollar a share. It really is a pretty disappointing loss. It takes It's a big hit on a relatively small trading account. I grew the account from about $1,000 up to just under $3,000 of total profit. So grow, grew, you know, the account value was three times higher than it started. Uh, but ultimately here, I end up stopping out. This is also another instance of a trade where my execution was a little slow on the sell side there. You may not have noticed that, but if we rewind it and play it again real quick, you're gonna notice about a two second delay between the order. It goes in one chunk and then waits two seconds and then goes in the next chunk. 
that's something I don't really understand. And I'm going to send an email and sort of complain a little bit to the broker and be like, hey, why is it happening that it's going in these chunks and not just getting all out? Because that's been happening during um, really the entirety of the challenge. But what it's meant is that when in fast moving markets, my orders are not filling quite as fast as I'd like them to. So there may be something that they can do to improve their routing or maybe, you know, who knows, maybe by having a seasoned trader bring it to their attention, they can troubleshoot it and figure out a solution. I don't know, you know, that's going to be on them if they want to do that. But it's something that I've noticed during this challenge. So here we are, day 14, taking a big loss. This is, uh, is it the biggest loss? I think this may be the second biggest loss because I had a pretty big loss on day one, if you recall. Okay, so a pretty big loss. And you, you would probably be safe to say, Ross, this is a good place to call it quits for the day. Uh, do I call it quits for the day? The answer is no. And so at the beginning of this episode, I talked about how this is a battle and success will come from those who are disciplined and who are patient. This is one of the biggest challenges with trading, knowing when to walk away. And there are times where we feel we should walk away, but we're not quite able to and we continue trading and on these days typically we dig the hole deeper and deeper and deeper so what ends up happening is i do go in for a second trade and this is just super frustrating it's the trump stock dwac and i had lost on this last week in my big account and i was like i never want to trade it again it's you know so frustrating the problem with it is that it's a higher priced stock higher price stocks have bigger spreads. And with the bigger spread, even though it was squeezing up on breakouts, the bid was not catching up. So it's almost like if we look at this on the whiteboard, it's almost as if the price is straddling levels. So we'll do, um, we'll just do this at $35, um, 36 and 37, 34 and 33. So we're gonna watch it around these half dollars, these, well, we're just gonna do whole dollars in this example, which is fine. So this is what I noticed. All right, so it squeezes up to 33, you know, drops down, comes back up, drops down, comes back up, gets up to 34, and then, you know, dumps down to 33, gets below 33, then comes back up to 34, then, then pops to 36, and then drops here back down. So like sort of these big ranges like this, and in these types of areas right here, this is what the level two would look like. It would be 30, uh, let's see, 33.85 by 34.25, for instance. And so your bid is here and this is your ask. And it's like, all right, I got in this at 33.90 for the breakthrough 34, the whole dollar. And I'm up, you know, 30 cents on the offer but I'm down five cents on the bid. And unless this thing really pulls away, I'm not gonna make money. See, here's the problem. When you have a 50 cent spread, if you have a 50 cent spread and you wanna make 50 cents, the stock needs to go up a dollar a share because of the spread, right? Now, yes, if you get in on the offer and you sell on the offer, you could capture 50 cents with just a 50 cent move. But typically, stocks that have 50 cent spreads, 70 cent, 80 cent spreads, it'll be hard to sell on the offer because a lot of the orders are going to start executing in between the spread. And unless it's really, really strong, your orders won't fill on the offer. And DWAC was not really, really strong. So I got into this incredibly frustrating struggle where I got in it does this sort of big spread. Well, let's let's go ahead and look at the trade. So let's look at the second trade for day 14. So watch this. I punch the order at 40 and I don't fill. My order doesn't fill at all. So I should be in right now 150 shares at $40, but my order didn't fill. So now I'm a little bit annoyed, but you can see, okay, so now it's 40.38 on the offer and I'm like, gosh, darn it, this thing is moving. Look at that. So, I, so now I chase it, I jump in. I should be up $150 right now, right? But I got frustrated and sort of just was like, you know what, I'll just jump in here. And it's up 55% on the day, but now instantly I'm down 30 cents on the bid. I end up adding another 300 shares. I put out my profit target at 42, which was the daily profit target I was watching. 
And now the bid is down to 40 and I'm down 170 bucks. And at this point, I was just sort of like seeing red. I was so frustrated. I was so annoyed. I saw this huge amount of volume that came in and you could see it's a huge volume candle on the one minute chart. You've got over 200,000 shares of volume. And then it just kind of stalled out. And this is what this stock does. It sort of moves up and then it stalls out, sort of moves up and then it stalls out. And I could have gotten out right here, more or less break even. But at this point, I was like, I'm going to hold this stock until it either hits my profit target or I pass away. <laughs> I was like, I was really seeing red. And, you know, I started saying my prayers. I was like, dear Lord, dear Lord, please, please, if you bring my family home, I promise I'll never, you know, it's like I was just getting, I, I was, I was really seeing red. Okay, so now at this point, it's been like 15 minutes, maybe longer. I'm still holding the trade, but I finally bail out there losing about $2 a share. Now, the sad thing is the stock ends up going up to like $50 a share later in the afternoon. It did go a bit lower, and I was looking at this on the one minute, and I'm like, it's a head and shoulders pattern. I had to leave. I had to go pick up my son from school. I, part of me was like, just set a stop and leave. And I was like, dude, you th don't do that. That's so irresponsible. If you just set a stop on this and leave, what if your stop doesn't execute for some reason? You just never know. And then next thing you know, I'm, you know, I'm my, my, my account's literally gone, right? So I just, so I ended up taking um, a series of big losses and I just, it was obviously a terrible day. It was a, this was a snowball day. And this is the reality where on this day, they won. The other guys won. The big institutional algorithmic traders, you know, the, I feel like they won. And this is a day where I lost, you know, I lost the battle and I lost it. It was my own fault. I lost composure. I got frustrated. I got emotional. And, you know, these are all of the things that happen to a lot of beginner traders. Now, for me, it's happening partly because of the pressure that I put on myself to trade every single day for this series, which, you know, just happened by the luck of the draw to launch during a time that the market was very cold and didn't provide a lot of opportunities. OK, so that's, you know, well, th that is what it is. So what do you do right what do you how do you handle that well obviously i didn't handle it as well as i could have um, but you know nonetheless i did find myself in a position where i grew the account all the way up to about three thousand, and now i've started to give back some profit and you know if we look at on, on the chart as it started rallying back up here i decided to buy back 115 shares and i was like i'm gonna just you know maybe i'll let this ride and i started thinking to myself uh, god it would have to go up you know, $10 a share for me to make a thousand bucks. And now I've got less buying power in the account, so I can't buy as many shares. And I'm like, you know, I've just really, I've really, I done screwed up here, um, made made some mistakes and I'm, I'm just gonna have to really reset. Uh, you know, there's not, not probably any way around it, I, at least just from an emotional perspective, because at this point, I, I gotta go back to sort of focusing on the basics. The problem is, and I end up losing, you know, a little over $100 on this trade too. So end up finishing the day even further in the red. The problem is um, I got myself into a position where I just got so amped up. I wasn't able to maintain discipline. And I think this is a really good lesson, a sort of a cautionary tale that when the stakes are high and you put a lot of pressure on yourself, you are almost setting yourself up to fail. Now, I've done a lot of small account challenges over the years. This one, however, was a little bit different because, and is a little bit different because of the cadence of doing weekly episodes. Uh, previously, I was doing just daily episodes, episode every single day, every single day. So it didn't really matter. It was like, ah, it's a slow day. It doesn't really matter. But for this one, because of sort of the turnaround of editing the video and putting it together, you know, it sort of was like, I need, a, I had to maintain a schedule. And that schedule was sort of regardless of market conditions. And that's something that's really challenging, you know? So for when I was a beginner trader, the pressure of like, I need to make X amount of money. So I pay my bills by the end of this month was an external pressure that the market doesn't care about, right? But when you start putting that on your own trading, it's gonna adversely affect the way you trade. It's gonna adversely affect your mindset and success does come down to mindset. So if we look at my failures in this small account challenge, it comes down 
to issues with mindset. Because those then, you know, sort of trickle down to decreasing my fuse, which meant I didn't have as much discipline. I didn't have as much patience. I then deviated away from my go-to strategy, which in a hot market might work, but when you're in sort of desperation mode, well, that doesn't work so well. But things are about to get even tougher. If you remember, at the beginning of this Small Account Challenge series, I told you that when we cross over 10,000 new subscribers, I'd reset my account. And that just happened, which means my account is being reset back to $1,000. Okay, so tomorrow is gonna be day one, take two, of trading with $1,000. The question is, should I do things a little differently this time around? And you should leave your comments down below and give me some feedback of what you think I did wrong and what you think I should do differently when it comes to strategy, execution, time of day, anything you wanna give me for feedback, I'm gonna be really appreciative of. So while tomorrow my account's gonna be back to $1,000, I'm gonna be really sort of back against the wall. I'm not gonna be able to afford to make some of the mistakes that I've made in the last couple of trading sessions. I'm gonna to have to be incredibly disciplined. I'm gonna to have to focus on just the best setups because I cannot afford any losses. But there is a little bit of a silver lining. I had said that once we cross over 10,000 thumbs up in this series, you would help me unlock my next piece of inventory to expand my trading station. And that happened last week. So last week we crossed over 10,000 thumbs up and I was able to unlock a new 24 inch monitor. This is my old one, which is broken as you recall. So it's still broken and I'm gonna use it as sort of a side chart or a monitor for looking at charts that are kind of like sort of on watch because it's still good. It's just not great for being my primary. So you guys helped me unlock this next piece of inventory. Thank you for that. And this is what we're gonna do. For the next 10,000 thumbs up, I'm gonna unlock something for you. Once we cross over the next 10,000 thumbs up for videos in this series, I'm gonna upload a deep dive breakdown of how I'm using level two and the time and sales right now to time my entries and my exits. This will be a long form educational upload that I think you guys are really gonna enjoy. So once we hit 10,000 thumbs up, I will unlock that piece of inventory for you. All right, so there's a little bit of a silver lining here to this episode. Now, for those of you that haven't already gotten a copy of my best-selling book, How to Day Trade the Plain Truth, I will put a link in the description for you to get a copy. I would love for you guys to read this while this uh, last week wasn't my, um, my, my best display of trading. My experience has spanned at this point decades. This is a picture of me uh, right in here from when I was uh, probably 12 or 13 years old, which is when I first got interested in the stock market. Uh, this was in the 90s during the dot-com bubble. In this book, what I decided to do was lay out my guardrails that I follow in my own trading. Now, these guardrails are only as good as the trader who's going to implement them and follow them. If you can't adhere to the rules, you will not find success. You can uh, read a couple of interviews that I did with uh, members at Warrior Trading, which I think you'll also enjoy, and you can print out the guardrails and you can put them on your desk. So get yourself a copy of How Day Trade the Plain Truth. There's a link in the description, and I look forward to seeing you guys for the next episode in this small account series, which will be me starting over with a thousand bucks. All right, I'll see you for the next episode real soon.